Get Global's India Super Session, presented by Sanam S4, an international market entry and business solution firm. The featured speakers are four prominent leaders in the U.S.-India business space. This session includes a special focus on emergent opportunities in India for independent U.S. producers, distributors, and others. Speakers include Mukesh Aghi, president of the U.S.-India Strategic Partnership Forum, who addresses the Indian business landscape in 2018. Atman Trivedi, managing director of Hills & Company, an international consulting firm advising companies on trade and investment, diplomacy, and politics. Ken Naz, the longtime former president of the Americas for Indian film production and distribution company, Eros International, who will share his perspectives from his experience leading the world's largest global distributor of Indian motion pictures. And attorney Arnold Peter Esquire, an active deal maker, executive, and producer in U.S. India cross border. Arnold will share views on the roles of independence in and with India. The India Super Session will be moderated by Ken Silverman, head of North America for Sanam S4 Group and chairman of the South Asia Studies Association. This session was captured live from Get Global in Los Angeles. Good afternoon and welcome to our uh, India Super Session. Uh, we're about to dive into a really exceptional presentation. Via the four seasoned and savvy gentlemen on my left, you're going to get a crash course in India and why it's so critically important to uh, U.S. businesses and international businesses, companies, uh, including global giants and SMEs to do business there. Uh, and since we're in Los Angeles, the world's media capital, we're also going to provide some insights uh, a unique insider's look at the cross-border media and entertainment industries uh, related to the U.S. and India, uh, as well as uh, talk about uh, emerging opportunities for independent companies uh, seeking to do business. If you uh, were at this morning's session that we did with Andy Kaplan, uh, CEO of Sony television networks, we uh, delved into what the major companies, uh, multimedia, multinational conglomerates are doing in India. So this is going to be a, uh, a little bit of a deeper dive, including a uh, unique look at the uh, Indian motion picture industry. My name is Ken Silverman, as you heard. I've been involved in uh, U.S.-India media and entertainment space for 20 years and more broadly in the uh, um, media and entertainment industry globally for uh, over 40 years. Currently, I'm head of North America for Sonom S4 Group, and we bring corporations, universities, nonprofits into India, set them up in business, hire their people, do their banking, file their documents, kind of a single uh, point of entry. We have uh, offices across India, about 140 people on the ground. Um, each person's uh, profile you see up here is uh, covered in your program, I believe, is certainly online, but I'm going to give you a, a brief snapshot of what, uh, who you will hear from, because it really is an extraordinary uh, panel of seasoned uh, experts in the field. Uh, first up will be Mukesh Aghi, president of the U.S.-India Strategic Partnership Forum. Uh, Mukesh was formerly CEO of a number of major companies, both in the U.S. and India, and several years years ago uh, shifted career so that he could uh, more actively lead and speed the process of U.S.-India cross-border uh, business transaction investment and so on. Uh, first as president of the U.S.-India Business Council and more recently as founder and president of the U.S.-India Strategic Partnership Forum, he has become truly the single individual who is most absolutely in the center of the crossroads between India and the U.S. from a business trade and investment standpoint. Um, Mukesh is, is second on the right, left, left. 
Um, uh, sitting next to Mukesh is Atman Trivedi, who is managing director of Hills and Company based in Washington. Atman previously spent a decade working within the US government focus on international relations and trade with the State Department, with the Department of Commerce, and with the uh, US Senate Foreign Relations Committee when it was headed by John Kerry. That's Atman on the end. Um, Ken Naz has been uh, Ken. Uh, Ken Naz has been in the international motion picture industry for more than 30 years, including two decades that he just completed as president of the Americas for Eros International, a New York stock exchange company, which is the largest producer and distributor of Indian motion pictures on earth. Ken is now building a new independent film company and will soon announce a number of significant projects. And finally, uh, Arnold Peter in the middle uh, is principal of the Peter Law Group and a consummate strategist and deal maker within the US India cross border media and entertainment industries. Uh, Arnold's is also on the board of Taj Hotels, Resorts, and Palaces, uh, one of probably the preeminent uh, hotel and resort chain in India, and he's the former uh, and longtime. Uh, the chairman of the Indian Film Festival of Los Angeles. Uh, and um, I'm especially pleased that everybody uh, came from various parts of the country to be here today and, and uh, proud that I can call each of these gentlemen friends. So um, as a spoiler alert, this is going to be a terrific panel. Uh, with that said, um, uh, each of our panelists is going to probably speak for six or seven minutes and then we'll uh, have some dialogue dialogue about the subject at hand. So uh, Mukesh will start uh, first and, and give us the, the big picture overview in terms of India. Thank you, Ken. I uh, thank you for the kind introduction. For the first time, I've, I wish my mother-in-law was here to, here to hear the introduction from you, Ken. <laughs> um, I, I think there's something uh, uh, interesting happening between India and the US which never took place since the independence of India 70 years ago. Two mega trends we are seeing. One is the rise of China and Asia Pacific is, is driving US to come closer to the US, uh, India itself, both from a market opportunity perspective and from a geopolitical perspective also. And if you look at under the Modi administration, uh, what we have seen is the trade or procurement by India on U.S. defense equipment has moved almost from a zero to $15 billion. And today, Secretary Tillerson is in India, and they're talking about much more advanced uh, supply of weapons to India itself. Uh, and that trend, I believe, will continue because U.S. has pulled out of Asia, and India is worried that the rise of China does have an impact, Pakistan does have an impact, and, and its role in Afghanistan does have an impact. So I think we will see a much, much closer collaboration between two countries going forward. And India has budgeted roughly quarter trillion dollar for the next seven years on procurement of defense equipment. And we feel that a la large number of that will be coming from the US. Today, India depends roughly 70% of its defense supplies on Russian equipment. So I think that trend is taking place. I think internally, uh, I would say two broad trends are taking place. One is there's a migration of roughly 400 million Indians from villages to the city itself. And that's the largest migration of humanity that has ever taken place. That means India has to build infrastructure, it has to build schools, it has to build security system, healthcare, and that provides tremendous market opportunity uh, for uh, companies coming into India itself. And today, the largest FDI is coming from the United States and India was the largest uh, recipient of FDI last year. I mean, look at the numbers, first nine months, it is still leading from that perspective. Uh, the average of a country of 1.3 billion people, roughly 65% are below the age of 25. So their purchasing power will continue to grow as the economy grows. 
The Indian economy did slow down to 5.7% last quarter, but we believe that that's a momentary blip uh, from the demonetization and implementation of global I mean, the general sales tax, GST, which is called. We believe, and according to the World Bank, next year the Indian economy will grow almost 7%. And as time goes by, we expect the economy to go up to an 8 to 9 percent for the next 20 to 25 years. So what happens is India provides a tremendous market opportunity, especially for U.S. companies. Now look at uh, Amazon has gained tremendous market share. You look at Uber has gained market share. Look at WhatsApp or Google. And all these companies have been shut out of China. So India has strategically realized that its partnership with the U.S. is not just going to be purely on, on the defense side, but it's going to be on the trade side, especially investment coming into India. We hosted the Prime Minister of India on June 27th in D.C. when he came to meet President Obama, uh, sorry, President Trump. And uh, we brought in roughly 20 CEOs together for a round table with the Prime Minister. And there were people like Jeff Bezos, Tim Cook, Jamie Dimon, uh, all the prominent CEOs. And the chairman of Carlyle stood up. Everybody said they have a positive story about India investment. But chairman of Carlyle stood up and he said, Mr. Prime Minister, we have 400 investments around the world. And India is my most profitable investment up to date itself. So I think from my, our perspective, we see the trajectory of partnership between two countries will keep on growing up because both are democracies, both have open systems, the value systems are similar. And I think what we see is a trend which will move positively in the next 20 years itself. Thank you. But before uh, we go to Atman, you use the term demonetization. For those in the audience who may not know what that is, because it's, it's groundbreaking, it's landmark. What is demonetization? Well, you know, India had two economies. One was the white economy, we call it, where people paid taxes. And you had the black economy, the underground, uh, uh, underground economy, where they paid no taxes. You have to understand, today only 1% of the Indians pay income tax. And, and, and so government had to scramble. So this Prime Minister, November 8th last year, decided that all 1,000 rupee note and 500 rupees note uh, are basically uh, no longer valid. And it kind of drove dramatically people to move their cash into, uh, into the banking environment. But more important, it jumped India from a cash economy in, in, into a more of a digital economy itself. And, and just like India moved from a, you know, it never went into landline from telecom industry, moved into wireless uh, overnight. I think what we're seeing is a trend in India which is moving not into credit card, but pure, uh, to digital economy, a digital payment environment itself. So that's what demonetization is all about. And, and it was, as I say, groundbreaking. And it, um, um, I don't know, were any of you in India when it hit? Because it was a complete surprise to vast parts of the population. So if you imagine, you know, you go home tonight and tomorrow morning you wake up and find you can't use your 10 or $20 bills, there's a run on the ATMs. Uh, it, it created momentary chaos, but as the dust has settled, it's, it's proven to be very, very beneficial, in, including uh, another big part of it, which was uh, seeking to, as it, to use your term, take black money out of the market. And so uh, uh, people uh, across uh, sectors of India that had huge wads of cash, which maybe they shouldn't have or were not legal wads of cash, suddenly it was kind of worthless. You had to take it to a bank and deposit it, which means you had to report it. And so many of these people were not reporting it. So demonetization was huge. Um, Atman. Atman, uh, as I explained, his uh, background has spent a lot of years within the government, dealing on a government-to-government -government basis, uh, and is now uh, with Hills and Company uh, doing it more on the private sector. So Atman is going to share with us about kind of government-to-government -government perspectives. 
Thanks, Ken. It's, it's really great to be here with uh, such a diverse and experienced group of uh, panelists. Um, happy Diwali to everyone, and uh, thanks to Get Global uh, for convening us. I'm going to focus uh, primarily on, on three areas today. Uh, first, I'm going to talk a little bit about the current relationship between the U.S. and the Indian governments and what it means for companies. Second, uh, chat a little bit about the resources that are available uh, on the part of the U.S. government uh, for companies looking at India. And third, uh, how to work with the Indian government uh, when you run uh, into some problems. Uh, despite despite uh, the recent uh, confusion in Washington, uh, relations uh, between the U.S. and India are off to uh, a very good start on uh, commercial issues. You know, that's important. A positive, well-functioning government-to-government relationship uh, can help address specific market challenges that companies face, can facilitate contracts and deals, and assist with systemic uh, issues like intellectual property. Uh, the two governments also help provide the enabling environments in which companies thrive and are able to innovate. Uh, the new White House uh, inherited a relationship that was uh, had a lot of positive momentum to it. Uh, the Prime Minister Modi's June visit, which Mukesh alluded to, uh, the two leaders built a very warm rapport. Uh, and, uh, you know, the visit went off without uh, any tweets. And uh, both governments want to make sure that the economic and commercial aspect of the relationship uh, keeps pace with uh, the, the momentum that's ha happening on security issues, as, as Mukesh laid out. Uh, these high-level meetings are important uh, for companies because they provide a good opportunity to ask questions of the governments and also elevate your company concerns. In a few weeks, um, we should have a better sense of how the two governments are progressing on the types of issues uh, that matter to government, uh, that matter to companies like tariffs and non-tariff barriers, intellectual property restrictions, regulatory and permitting rules. I think the key question to keep an eye on is how the U.S. side's make in America approach, you know, the synergies between that and Prime Minister Modi's make in India uh, approach. Both leaders are intent on job creating manufacturing uh, in their countries. And there's going to be in India, over a million youth a month are surging into India's cities uh, as part of the rural uh, urban uh, transformation that's taking place in, in India. Uh, the White House uh, uh, and, and some leaders are, are focused on uh, the trade deficit. Uh, the trade deficits are, are seen by the new team as kind of uh, a barometer for the health of the overall relationship. Uh, and it's important uh, that uh, on trade and commercial issues uh, that you don't take a winner-take-all uh, approach to it. Um, the U.S. side can raise um, you know, much uh, needed structural, economic, as well as business reforms, uh, but you can do that uh, without making the commercial relationship transactional. And I think that'll be very important uh, going, going forward. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, uh, if you're a company, uh, the White House is, is very keen on increasing uh, exports to India, but it's a little bit more ambivalent about job creating investments, um, you know, uh, going outside of the United States. And so that could create some tension with American businesses that are increasingly adopting localization strategies in India and other markets, um, especially if you're a U.S. company that's manufacturing uh, in India to export back into the U.S. market. Uh, second, I'm going to say a few words about uh, the U.S. government resources uh, that are out there for companies. Uh, commerce is a good starting point uh, if you're looking to uh, export to India. Uh, they can help answer questions related to market intelligence, uh, sectoral advice and market entry. 
they put out uh, good resources like a country commercial guide on India and a top markets report that's organized by various sectors. Uh, locally, U.S. export assistance centers uh, are terrific resources if you're just getting started, and they can help connect you to the foreign commercial service uh, that's located in India, and also to uh, Commerce Department's India experts. Uh, the foreign commercial service is uh, in seven offices across India, and uh, 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 has, has a presence in 15 other cities. Uh, and they're good in terms of uh, providing local intelligence, uh, and they can help in terms of identifying local partners and helping you due diligence uh, in working with those partners. Um, Commerce's Advocacy Center is a good resource if you're looking to do uh, business with the Indian government uh, and you're interested in uh, bidding on government contracts. Uh, the U.S. Trade Representative's Office uh, is comprised of trade experts uh, who tackle uh, market access issues, uh, intellectual property concerns, and uh, tariff and non-tariff barriers. Uh, the State Department is another terrific resource. Uh, its Foreign Service officers carefully monitor macro macroeconomic conditions and, and policy trends uh, on the ground in, uh, in, in India, both at the embassy in Delhi and also at the consulates uh, spread out across the country. Um, if you're looking for export financing uh, or you're interested in financing uh, of your investment in India, there are three agencies uh, worth keeping uh, an eye on. Uh, the XM Bank, the U.S. Trade and Development Agency, and finally the Overseas Private Investment uh, Corporation. Um, last but not least, you shouldn't forget your congressman uh, who can be a, an effective advocate uh, before the U.S. government as, and also the Indian government. So finally, what I'm going to do is I'm going to offer four suggestions, you know, four strategies on, on how to uh, think about working with the Indian government. Um, as Mukesh laid out, India has made real progress in, in attracting uh, foreign investment. But when it comes to uh, U.S. exporters, there are sometimes obstacles that you may encounter in terms of tariffs and non-tariff barriers and you know, localization rules and things of that nature. So how should you approach working with, with uh, India? Uh, first, play the long game. Uh, build trusted relationships over time with doers at the central level uh, at, with Indian states and also with municipalities. Um, second, work with trusted partners uh, who have on the ground knowledge of India's government and pre-existing rela relationships with Indian officials. They know who to seek out, but just as importantly, who you want to avoid and how to navigate India's complex uh, regulatory landscape. Third, you want to try to align your business plans with key central uh, and local government priorities. Uh, and you want to be able to show uh, the Indian government that you're a partner uh, in uh, India's socioeconomic transformation and India's move from an informal economy to a formal economy. Uh, fourth and finally, take a state-by-state -state approach when you're thinking about India. You know, political and economic conditions vary across the uh, 29 states, and the sheer size of the individual state economies presents a real business opportunity. You take a state like Maharashtra uh, that has a GDP of 250 billion, and that's about the size of the economy of Ireland. Uh, you know, states control Im important inputs like land and water. Um, uh, you know, and you're going to find that there are differences in terms of the quality of governance, taxation, uh, labor relations, and educational levels across the states. Uh, so overall, uh, there's tremendous opportunity out there in India because of its youth, uh, because of uh, uh, the, the use of technology, 
uh, the, the, the growing economy and uh, just the overall demographics. Uh, but if you do your homework, so thank you. Thank you. And, and one thing to add to that and kind of piggyback on what both uh, Atman and Mukesh said, um, they made reference to Prime Minister Modi, who came into office about three years ago, I believe. Yep. Um, he had been uh, chief minister of the state of Gujarat, uh, which was known as uh, having created an economic miracle. So he was elected to office about three years ago with, with the mission and the mandate, uh, the largest electoral mandate in a generation in India to do for the country what he did for Gujarat. And so things like demonetization, uh, cutting down in bureaucratic red tape, cutting down on corruption have been uh, part of his mandates. And he is by and large considered as succeeding. And so this has created uh, an enormous positive climate for doing business in India, which starts right at the very top and it has permeated uh, down the chain. Uh, we're going to switch horses and now uh, talk about the Indian motion picture industry, which, uh, as you'll find out, is significantly more than Bollywood. Uh, so in that regard, Ken Naz has been doing it for 20 plus years. And as I mentioned, was uh, CEO for the Americas for the largest Indian film producer and distributor. So Ken, what should we know? Um, first of all, thank you, Ken. Uh, you said the right thing when you say we've been friends for such a long time, and I'm also honored to be with uh, such distinguished guests on this stage, so uh, uh, thank you for that honor. Um, I wanted to start off for about a minute to talk more, you know, talk about what's been uh, something that I, some, a text that was sent to me uh, about a month ago, and I wanted to read it, and I, I said, this is a great text. It was an article uh, in the Economic Times, in, and it was from Jamie Dimon, he's chairman and CEO of JP Morgan, and he's, and his, uh, I'll just quote, it's a big article, but just I'll just quote two, three lines. It said, India is growing faster than any other country on the planet. The government has made a lot of changes, which is going to be very good for the future. The effect that they have is not going to say much about a lot of good changes that are being made with Aadhaar, GST, and all the bankruptcy law, all of which are very positive. And you have a very good and strong prime minister, and he's made a lot of changes. So, uh, like I said, he's saying that it's going to be the fastest, uh, you know, growing uh, economy in the world. So that's, you know. Um, I recall many years ago, uh, you know, I lived in uh, New York, New Jersey area, and of course come to LA a lot because of the business I'm in, I go to India, but I remember coming to uh, LA many, many years ago and meeting one of the big executives of one of the studios here. At that point, you know, they were not looking at India. This must have been about 12, 15 years back. And we started talking about India, and I asked him, you know, I've heard that you guys are also looking into India, and what is the reason? He goes, I think we finally, his, uh, to quote him, and you know, I, I think we finally realized that you can't ignore 1.2 billion people in this world. And uh, you know, so I, th I thought that was a, a telling uh, two lines that he said to me. So, so. now, getting back to the, the film industry, um, there are, some people, you know, may, uh, I'm sure most people will agree with me that there are three major things in India, films, uh, religion, and cricket, if you think about it, you know, and some of my friends and, you know, some of us will say also food, but let's say the three, uh, you know, movies, religion, and cricket, and sometimes in that order, uh, people love movies, uh, people, of course, love, you know, cricket, and people, of course, all follow religion. But movies are something which are, which have always been very, very popular for years and years, all through my life, all through my, you know. I remember when I was a little boy, my mother would say, you know, um, I have to go to the theater uh, tomorrow because, you know, the whole idea was to watch the show, the first day, first show. That was the, the, the th thing over there. And a question that used to get asked to me or has been asked to me many times is, you know, who watches Indian movies, Bollywood movies, you know, song and dances, who watches it? 
And the question, uh, the answer to that question is a lot of people in this world. Um, you know, of course, there's traditional markets like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, all the neighbor countries. But you won't believe this. There are a lot of people, people in countries like Russia, in Middle East, in the Caribbean islands. Uh, many of these, and you know, United States, Germany, uh, South Korea, and you know, they they love movies. And years ago, and I'm thinking about 2007, 2008, there was a study done by Harvard. Uh, if I recall correctly, in that year, they were trying to figure out how many tickets are sold, number of tickets are sold uh, for movies around the world. And I remember reading in that particular year, there were 3.1 billion tickets that were sold for, uh, for American movies. So, you know, all over the world in that year. Uh, for Indian movies, that particular year was somewhere between 3.9 and 4.1 billion. So you can see the numbers much higher. Ticket prices were a little low that time. They're getting better. You know, now it's about three dollars a ticket, but it is a growing. You know, it's it's, it's a very great opportunity. Um, some of the movies that are coming out of India are, you know, without getting into some you know boring numbers and all that, which I would welcome to share with you. But uh, for example, there was a movie um, that recently that was released. Uh, the name of the movie is called Dangal. It did uh, 300 plus million dollars worldwide. This is US dollars, 300 million plus. It, you'll be very surprised to know in China alone, in China, that movie did almost 200 million dollars. So that's a growing market. It's, it's huge. United States, it was around 30 million dollars, you know. Um, there was another movie, uh, Bahubali 2, which has grossed about $300 million, it's not, I, I don't believe it's released in China yet, but many of these movies are doing amazing business and uh, they're doing business worldwide because of the, you know, at the interest level that's coming out. Uh, some of our stars, I'll give you a little example, one of our stars was, you know, goes to the Berlin F F Film Festival in Germany and there are lineups of, uh, you know, people on the streets, there's not that many Indian people in Germany, mostly you know, uh, real Germans, you know. I wanted to say real German, that is not right for some reason. But, you know, and, and they're lined up on the street because they love the Bollywood movies, you know, and, and um, so, you know, and um, just to keep this thing very short, I could go on because I love this. Um, I could quickly tell you that, you know, the movie business is, it, it has nowhere but to grow because the, the multiplexes are growing all over India. Uh, the world is shrinking because of the digital opportunities, as we all know. So people are getting more and more exposed. And as we're going to these new markets, uh, and you know, as you know, places like France, Germany, Poland, uh, South America is about to take off. Uh, it's huge, of course, in India, and you know, in those places, movies are doing amazing. Um, you can have an average movie doing anywhere from you know. Uh, 10, 20, 30, 50 million dollars plus just in India alone. So uh, it's a great business and uh, you know there's lots of opportunities of collaboration between the rest of the world and India and you know I, every day I get new calls you know we're from Turkey, we're from here, we want to be able to do you know uh, collaboration so lots of opportunities there. Thank you and um, uh, Arnold again, I've known for many years, uh, is active in the uh, US, India, and, and India international space. And uh, much of it in what I would call the independent area and off the beaten track, not traditional Bollywood movies. So if you would talk a little bit about what's happening that's uh, unusual, uh, that doesn't involve either the big Hollywood studios sending blockbusters to India or the big Indian studios sending blockbusters to the U.S. and the rest of the world? Yeah, <clears throat> I'm primarily a um, U.S.-based lawyer working in uh, uh, working with Indian producers and production companies and studios. So um, I wanted to focus my comments on the opportunities that exist for US-based independent producers and production companies. So the first uh, major opportunity for US-based independent producers 
is in the area of remakes. Um, uh, films made outside India, particularly English language films made outside India, have been remade forever. Uh, the problem was no one was actually paying for those remake rights, and the piracy was pretty blatant. And about, uh, I'd say about seven years ago, there was this one incident that really was a watershed and kind of changed the whole remake business. Uh, Warner Brothers, as I'm sure everyone in the audience knows, their biggest franchise is uh, Harry Potter. Well, an Indian film came out uh, that was a complete Harry Potter ripoff, and believe it or not, it was called by the Indian name for Harry Potter, which is Harry Putter. <laughs> Warner Brothers got really upset about that. They uh, basically got the film shut down, and then Indian producers really began to appreciate and realize you just can't steal these remake rights. You have to go and you negotiate for those. And you get those rights from uh, independent producers who made these films. Now, uh, the focus is on independent producers because the major studios uh, who spend $100 million to make a franchise film are not going to sell you remake rights. It's just not happening. However, independent producers, you know, make a film for three, four, five million dollars that gets a theatrical release. They're open to then allowing that same film to be remade in English, uh, from English or other languages, quite frankly, into Hindi language films. So that's a great opportunity for independent producers who have achieved some success. Uh, with a theatrical release of an independent film um, to sell those remake rights in India. And in the last two years, I've negotiated remake rights in about six, uh, with six pictures. Uh, three of them have already been made in India, two are in production and are going to be released. So that's one area. Another area is our co-productions. And I'll just give you two examples of, of, of films that I've worked on that are very interesting. So one of them is an Indian producer by the name of Vinod Chopra. Vinod Chopra is one of the biggest uh, producers, directors, writers in India. <clears throat> and uh, I believe it was two summers ago, he came to the United States and really made the first English language film that was pre written, produced, and directed by, by an Indian. Had nothing to do with India, had nothing to do with Bollywood. It was produced um, in, 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 in collaboration with Sony Pictures. Um, Andy Kaplan, who was here earlier, knows you know, about it. Um, it starred Vincent D'Onofrio, and uh, uh, it was, yeah, I wouldn't say it's a huge success, but it shows the opportunities that exist. Another film I worked on was uh, Nicole Kidman's last big film. Uh, it was called Grace and Monaco. Um, opened the Cannes Film Festival three years ago. Uh, was sold to the Weinstein Company, and unfortunately, they didn't do very much with it. Um, however, not very many people know this, but that film was entirely financed by an Indian studio. So there are these opportunities. So you know, the the there's remake opportunities, there's co-productions, and then the third um, opportunity for American. Our, uh, writers, producers, directors, and Ken and I were talking about this on the phone this weekend, is in the area of television. The, te uh, the, the film business in India is fairly mature. However, the television business is really in its infancy. There's tremendous opportunities. The Indian television business, probably where our television business was about 30 years ago. 
So there's tremendous opportunities for uh, content specifically made for Indian television. A number of American companies are already there. Amazon, for example, is creating its own channel in India to create new content uh, for the Indian market. So th those are three examples and three areas of opportunities for people in the audience who may be uh, producers, directors, and writers. Thank you. It's, it's a, a couple of things worth pointing out. I'm, I'm watching the clock. One is um, uh, unknown to most people, I guess, but the uh, first Hollywood studio to go into India was Universal Pictures, and they did it over 100 years ago. Universal had an office in India in 1916. Uh, one of the things that came out of that is the, uh, the classic Indian mythological epics, the Mahabharata and so on, that were filmed or turned into like 200 episode miniseries were all based on the biblical epics that were distributed in India, uh, US silent films, King of Kings, those kind of things which were made here, sent to India, and then India did their own version of it. Uh, two other things uh, I'll mention quickly, and then anybody can jump into this. There were two other terms uh, used on the panel. One is GST and one is ADAR, and, and both of these are, are really part of the, uh, the economic miracle uh, happening in India. GST is the goods and service tax, and that was implemented, I think, within the last 12 months, eight months. Yeah. Um, but what it means is for the first time ever in India, there is a universal same tax across all Indian states, across all of the country. So in the old days, uh, an American or international company coming into India had to deal with, well, it's, here's the tax structure in Maharashtra, but in Tamil Nadu, it's completely different. In Andhra Pradesh, it's another one. And it created a little bit of chaos for companies coming in. Uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, implemented the goods and services tax, and now it's uniform across the country. The, the other part, which is absolutely revolutionary as well, is ADAR. And ADAR are cards and numbers that are comparable to our social security numbers. So for the first time in history in India, I think now it's over a billion people, uh, over a billion of the 1.3 billion people have the equivalent of social security numbers which allows them to do banking and voting and you know everything that we're so used to. And it was um, a gentleman named Nanda Nilakani, who is the CEO of uh, which company? Infosys. Infosys. Um, again, took a, a leave of absence from running this monster uh, technology company to make it his mission to drive Fourth, uh, this, this ADAR program, and there has never been anything like it in history. This, this one billion plus people who have now gotten social security card, three years, less than three years, something like that, uh, astounding. So hopefully the, and I'm, I'm looking at the big overtime thing, um, hopefully the, the message that has come across is that India is, is a country you need to know about. Uh, our company, Sonomous 4, is uh, bringing companies into India from absolutely across uh, every industry, from food to medical devices to paints to technology, everything under the sun. Um, you need to go in cautiously, and, and uh, Atman's advice was very wise, but uh, we're all here because we're uh, passionate about India and in a belief in the uh, economic uh, strength and viability of India and as it uh, impacts uh, U.S. and international uh, companies. Having said that, I'm going to eat up a little more time. Uh, could we quickly go down the line and, and one last parting thought, and maybe we'll just go uh, starting with you, Atman, and down the line. What, what's a parting message that you would like to give the audience about India? I just said it's an it's, uh, incredible market to, to watch over the next you know, 20, 30 years, Morgan Stanley has said that uh, India is going to uh, experience the largest growth of the major markets over the next decade. And I think it, you know, you look at the demography, the focus on digitization, um, and the overall fundamentals of the economy, they all add up to 
a tremendous amount of potential that we've only just begun to tap. Thank you. Well, I believe, I think you'll see a much more closer alignment uh, between India and the U.S. in a geopolitical scenario. When I say close alignment, it will be from a defense perspective, from a cultural perspective. India has 162,000 students in the U.S. contributing roughly $9 billion in tuition fee. We expect that to double in the next five years itself. I think you'll see more and more penetration of U.S. companies gaining market share, especially in the infrastructure environment where India plans to spend roughly $2.4 trillion in the next 10 years. So I think the opportunity and the partnership between India and U.S. will move in a positive direction. Thank you. So in the entertainment industry, uh, the two biggest mistakes that individuals and companies make when they go to India is they think, wow, billion eyeballs. I'm just going to dump all of my uh, product into India, just dub it in Hindi or another Indian language and make a fortune. The other mistake that uh, companies make is to assume that India is just a source of a quick buck and easy money. And people who make those mistakes, the, the road to a quick buck in India is littered with many casualties. So that is a very important uh, lesson to learn and that any business in India, particularly because I know it's the entertainment industry, uh, it's a long-term play and you need to make a commitment to it. Thank you, Ken. Um, again, you know, there's so many opportunities as we've heard from the, the uh, members on the stage here uh, with such a, you know, uh, with population that's young, uh, with billion, 1.4 billion people, and the world shrinking in the entertainment industry uh, with all the digital ages and lots of stuff going on. I think there's, a, uh, there's lots and lots of opportunities and uh, it, it's very exciting and uh, figures are showing that as well. 